Welcome to my video on using clock in basic instrument training. This video is intended for my early stage students and explains my use of a clock and some of the drills that I use in my basic instrument training. Once a student becomes reasonably proficient in basic instrument flying on the six basic flight instruments, or the six pack as it's sometimes called, I need to expand their scan. I'm trying to simulate the use or the inclusion of navigation instruments. The clock serves this purpose well and serves as a good surrogate for the navigation instruments. The basic six-pack instruments are dynamic. They show a nearly instantaneous state of the airplane. Push or pull on something and you see the effect immediately. The navigation instruments behave somewhat differently. You must read, then interpret, decide on an action, take an action, monitor the progress, reinterpret, and make corrections. These instruments do not react immediately. So it's a new addition to our scan and to our skill set as an instrument pilot. To restate, I'm expanding the scan, introducing new skills with the clock. The ability to interpret, make decisions about actions are important next steps. The clock also allows me to simulate critical instrument tacks without the need for navigation facilities. One of the drills that I do is to simulate a glide angle. And I can do that drill anywhere in the practice area. I don't need to find an ILS somewhere, but the clock drill can simulate the most important fundamental skills for tracking the glide slope. A point to make about doing these drills. I try to start the drill at a specific point on the clock. That is the initiation of action at the start of the drill is driven by something external to the student. They're watching something develop on the clock and at the appropriate time, they have to start the maneuver. This is important because when you are flying on instrument navigation, your progress on the procedure is driven by factors outside of your control. You're progressing down the path in the instrument procedure at a pace and you don't really have control over that. So unless you're in a simulator, you can't stop to pause and think. You must take action, ready or not. A common problem that I've seen over the years is that students will be watching a navigation instrument and they'll see the needle center. They seem to need to process the information for a moment and often delay the start of the needed action. This is particularly true for glide slope intercept. I can't tell you how many times I've watched a student observe glide slope intercept and delay the start of the descent. Then they get behind and need to play catch up from the very beginning. The clock tends to force people into taking action when needed, ready or not. Before I go further, let's talk about clocks. All airplanes are required to have a clock. The FAR used to require a clock with a sweep second hand, but that's now gone with the digital clocks and chronometers. For these exercises, I much prefer an analog sweep second hand clock because most of our navigation instruments are analog. There's some digital information, but most of the time we're looking for something that's physically moving. Similarly, I prefer an analog motion like the movement of the sweep second hand. If I could create the ideal clock training aid, I would find an analog sweep second hand clock that's about the size of an OBS, and I would affix it to the primary OBS in a cockpit, usually the number one VOR. I've also used my iPhone. I have an app with a nice analog clock face, and sometimes I hold that in front of the VOR OBS. With that, let's take a look at some of the specific things that I do in my instrument training program. The first thing that I start with is the standard rate turn drill. This is actually part of a normal instrument training program and it's called for in the FAR. Timed turns may be required on your check ride. So we know that a standard rate turn takes two minutes to complete a full 360 degrees or one minute for a 180 degree turn. Here is an annotated clock showing you the checkpoints. In this figure, you can see that at 15 seconds into the drill, you should be 45 degrees into the turn. Similarly, at 30 seconds into the drill, 90 degrees, and 180 degrees after a full minute. This drill is quite useful, and I extend the idea throughout basic instrument training phase. Sometimes I ask students to make short turns on the clock, or in some cases, just use the clock in their head. So for example, a 10 degree turn should take three and a half seconds at standard rate and almost seven seconds at half standard rates. So when we're making short turns, particularly during partial panel work, it's often useful to keep track of time in our head to make these short turns and short heading corrections. Drill expands the student's scan and gets them used to using the clock. 
This illustration shows the scans associated with the drill. The student expands his or her scan, observes the progress of the turn, makes adjustments to the bank in order to compensate for their actual progress. And so the skill of reading, interpreting, taking action, and making corrections is reinforced. Another element of this drill is to practice the use of the index marks on your directional gyro. I really encourage students to get used to using these index marks. They're very helpful in a lot of different situations. During the time turn drill, we can interpret the index marks on the directional gyro and correlate them with elapsed time. A reference heading will pass an index mark every 15 seconds. Once the turn drill is mastered, or at least the student is doing it good enough, I move on to climbs and glides. Here is an illustration of the checkpoints on the clock that indicate where I should be in terms of my climb or descent. So at 15 seconds, I should be 125 feet into the climb or descent, at 30 seconds, 250 feet, and so forth. At one full minute, I've climbed or descended 500 feet. I typically do these drills for 1,000 feet or two minutes. The best practical application for this drill is a simulated glide slope. This is one of my favorite drills and it parallels and reinforces the kinds of skills that you need to be able to master to track a glide slope. Most glide slopes have a nominal descent rate of about 500 feet per minute at the typical speeds that we fly with a three degree glide angle. Glide angles are not always 500 feet, but it's generally close enough. The glide slope drill goes as follows. We set up the airplane in our approach level configuration at approach speed. Sometimes I have this student do some turning to simulate being vectored to the final approach course. At some predetermined point on the second hand, we will simulate glide slope intercept. At that point, or slightly before, the student commences a 500 foot per minute rate of descent. Based upon the previous illustration, we're looking for a descent to progress along the tick marks on our clock. Normally I do this drill for a thousand feet, so after one minute I should be 500 feet below and two minutes a thousand feet below my starting point. I typically couple this with the missed approach procedure. I start the drill at say 3,000 feet. After one minute we should be 2,500 feet. After two minutes we should be at 2,000 feet, at which time the student is expected to execute a missed approach. I generally have the student execute the missed approach at a specified altitude, whether or not they're there on time, because the criteria for executing a missed approach is when I get to decision height. This drill can be done anywhere in the practice area. I don't need an ILS or anything else. It transfers quite well to flying a real glide slope. The student monitors the clock, determines whether or not they are above or below the glide slope based upon whether or not they are ahead or behind on the clock. If, for example, the student reaches 2,500 feet in less than one minute, that means that they are slightly below glide slope and they must make a correction. So they must change the rate of descent. The critical point is interpreting and making a correction. If I'm below the glide slope, I must change my descent rate from 500 feet per minute to perhaps 300 feet per minute and vice versa. That means a small pitch change and slightly lower airspeed until we're back on the glide path. And this is precisely the skill that we must develop to fly the glide slope. And finally, I put it all together in a maneuver I call the cork screw. This combines a, the turn and the climb drills. It's really a good scan exercise. I consider it a good graduation exercise. Also, I find the climbs much more difficult than the descents. So do this drill partial panel and you're flying pretty darn good basic instruments. Lastly, I think these drills add challenge and interest for the student. It gets a bit boring just making turns and climbs and glides. And I think these drills give the student some better measure of how well they're flying. Well, I hope you found this video useful and should give you a head start if you're flying with me. So thanks for watching.